doing, Chris? All right? Good. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm good. Are you in Texas right now? I am. Yeah. Just hanging out in Dallas. Everything going okay down there or same as everyone else? Yeah. I mean, it's everything shut down, uh, yeah. whatever, shelter in place or whatever. Right. right. Whatever, whatever they're calling it these days. Right. Um, all right. So, so let's get going here. We got, uh, we got everyone pretty much viewing it here and I'm sure they'll, uh, they'll keep flying in now that we're live. Um, but I did, I, first off, we want to thank you guys. Um, this is our first uh, webinar with the three of us. So we're super excited to have uh, you guys on board. Um, it's not every day that we start a webinar and we got a PGA Tour player and a PGA Tour coach. So we, we certainly really appreciate you guys taking the time, especially on a Friday night at seven o'clock. Um, I know, <laughs> canceling crazy plans. <laughs> right, right. Things are crazy out there. Right? So, but seriously, thank you very much. Um, so it, well, without further ado, I just want to kind of welcome the viewers that we have on here, um, kind of ex explain who we have on here. And the, the first thing is real quick, um, the three of us, I got Colin Amaral, Sarah Stone and myself. Um, give everyone a quick overview real quick on how this started. Uh, we're just three friends that love golf, met each other at the uh, John Webster Golf Academy in Palm Beach at the Breakers. Um, and we decided to take this show on the road, so to speak. So again, super excited to have you guys. Uh, and, and we're really excited for the information that we feel the viewers are all going to get out of this. Um, my, our goal, Jamie specifically, is to kind of... Um, us being similar ages, I certainly watched that name climb the leaderboard in junior golf. Um, as I missed cuts in the AJGA, I always saw your damn name at the top of every board, especially when I take planes out to San Diego from Long Island. It was a real, real good usage of my time. <laughs> um, so first thing is, uh, Jamie, you, you were raised in California, correct? Yeah, San Diego. Um, born and raised 20, you know, 22 years, so. Feels like a long time ago, but um, yeah, my entire life I was I was I was golfing in San Diego. Right. So j just to kind of give everyone a little backdrop here on this, uh, raised in California, played for the USC, uh, loved the shirt, two-time All-American at USC. Uh, what I find the most interesting part is who was on your Walker Cup team and who you played against on your Walker Cup uh, experience. And just to kind of let everyone hear this for a minute, we had Ricky Fowler. Uh, Billy Horschel, Dustin Johnson, Webb Simpson, and competed against uh, Rory and Danny Willett. So I thought that was kind of a, a fun little tidbit there. Um, number one in the world rankings at one point, won the Western Am, won a whole bunch of HAPA. So um, I, I, I kind of want to start there. And my goal is to kind of segment this into how you met Chris and, and the role that Chris plays on, in your career. Um, today but more so where I want to touch upon is if you can kind of take us back to your junior golf days because what I find interesting is you learned how to win at a young age and you learned how to post numbers at a super young age um, so if you kind of we have a lot of juniors right now view, viewing in um, probably between the ages of 16 17 8 years, 18 years old a lot of guys looking to uh, compete in college golf and I think I think that's a real fun storyline to start out with and then we can kind of take it from there. Yeah, um, I think my first ever junior event, I was, I believe I was six and it was a 10 and under and it was at Kalina Park in San Diego and it was a par three course, probably the longest hole was 110 yards and every every hole was hit off mat, get up a mat, hit the green and I ended up finishing like fourth and I was a huge, I was big in the football, basketball and baseball at the time so I didn't really care too much for golf. Um, but I remember taking home the trophy. I remember seeing the photo still in my mind and going, wow, this is pretty fun. Like, I'm competing out there. You know, it's a great sport. You're, you're on your own the entire time. So, um, and then it built from there. But I remember being like 13 or 14, a freshman in high school. And I hadn't really like popped on the, on the national level yet. And I remember seeing all the scores, like kids were shooting like 66, 67, 64 to win these age, AGA events by, you know, they're shooting 12, 14 under par. I'm going, like, how, how do you do that? Like, I, just, I can only shoot four under and I'd shoot a couple over. And I just never got, I never found the ability to 
just keep going low every day and every day in these tournaments. And it wasn't until I was 16 or um, I really kind of got a feel for shooting consecutive, you know, rounds well under par, which would, which is what it took to win these AGAG events. So I would say that all these junior golfers, you know, I wasn't, I didn't really start playing great. So I was 16 or 17. So, you know, if you're 13, 14, 15, and not really finding success, you know, you're still crazy young. And even though I found success in the AJGA, there's tons of guys on tour that don't have success until they get on, until they become a professional. So, you know, it's just a long process. Golf's a long career. You can play until you're 55, 60. So um, don't feel the rush to succeed at a super young age. Now, Jamie, real quick, um, sports growing up, was it solely golf or were you, or did you play a ton of sports? I played everything, um, everything but hockey and soccer pretty much. I, I, was, I was big into baseball. Um, my dad played collegiate basketball at a really good Division One school in Drake. And I played, ton, um, played a lot of tennis, um, baseball, basketball, football. You kind of name it, I played it. And I think that was a great – um, it's a great avenue to become a better athlete in general, which would obviously, you know, help your hand-eye coordination and help the ability to figure out on a day-to-day -day basis how to become the, a better golfer. Thank you. Can I ask, can I ask Jamie a question? Yeah, yeah please. Oh. <laughs> so, so when you, when you were kind of a, a junior and you were just be able to shoot around under par, but not necessarily consecutive rounds, was there anything that clicked for you either mentally or physically in your game or like all of a sudden that, that started to happen? It just kind of happened. Just like you just kept trying and then you did it. It just kind of, it just kind of happened. And I, I remember going back when I was probably 13 and all these kids that are 15 were hitting it so much further than me. And like, they're all, they're always like one day you'll wake up and hit it further. And one day I woke up and I hit it further. It was like the weirdest thing, like a month after, you know, whatever it was. I would play my home course, and I'd be 20, 30. Did your voice change that day also? You uh, <laughs> think it changed that day. Uh, but I would just – You're like, like, why am I hitting it further all of a sudden? <laughs> Everything was just – I wish nice. that would happen to me. <laughs> Things just became a little easier, and I think that's just a maturity thing. It could happen at different ages. And, um, you know, for me, it just kind of clicked. And, you know, I'm not really sure why it did, to be honest with you. What about uh, your body, Jamie? You're, you're obviously a, a pretty tall guy now. Um, at what point did you start growing into a, a, a taller body in junior golf? Did that play a role in your swing or your game? I was always tall. I was always the tallest in my grade, just about, you know, I was the top one or two um, tallest in my grade until I was probably, well, I guess I probably still am, but um, I was always used to being on the taller side of things. I didn't really notice it until I kind of got to a point where I was above average and I needed you know a little bit longer clubs to feel comfortable hitting um, a golf shot but um, I think I was 6'3 172 going into freshman year of college so I was tall and skinny and then you know right now I'm almost 6'5 and a few extra pounds I guess Qu quarantine pounds yeah I actually look pretty good <laughs> All right. <laughs> I can't find a gym, so I'm just I'm wiltering away. All right. All right. So, um. So so now, as you kind of took yourself through junior golf, um, obviously you played at a very high level in amateur golf. Um, take take us through now uh, after college. So you won two national championships at USC. Is that correct? Just one. Just one. Yeah. So you won a national championship at USC. Um, did you did you leave school right after that? That was my freshman year. I left after my junior year. I left after my third year. So um, I turned pro. Had a um, a handful of exemptions on the PGA Tour due to my success in college golf, and um, you know that thing that jump started my professional career. Right. Now, now that you had at what point did you were you starting to see injury in your body? Was that was that during college? Was that after? Uh, I had a couple. I broke my finger playing basketball in college, right. and I actually fractured my rib golfing. So that was kind of a freak accident. Um, the biggest one was when I turned pro in two thousand. I turned pro in two thousand nine. I got hurt in the end of two thousand ten, 
I herniated two discs in my back. So I had surgery the following year. So that was a big one. Um, but, you know, from 2010 till last year, I was perfectly healthy and in great spirits. Right. So, so I guess kind of when Sarah and Colin and myself were talking uh, uh, about this interview and getting excited <clears throat> about this interview, what I found very interesting was um, you, worked with, you worked with a few instructors before you made your way to Chris. And um, at least the little bit that I know of Chris is, is Chris is certainly one of the, one of the youngest, most um, intelligent brains in, in our world. Um, in terms of from a research standpoint. So I guess what I'm curious on is on your, on your way to getting to Chris, um, what were some obstacles that, that you went through with the swing? And then what drew you to Chris? Yeah, um, I saw, uh, so yeah, probably I've had three instructors prior to, to Chris. Um, and things were ups and downs with everybody, with every instructor you ever have. And I think the main point, the main takeaway would be that you can have an instructor for two or three years, even two days and find a way to take some good tidbits from everybody. Um, and I've taken what I've learned from all my instructors, even back to Chris Ambry who was my college coach mm -hmm. and apply that to my game today. Um, you know, just cause things don't work out with a certain instructor doesn't mean you don't learn anything. Um, I have found, numerous things that I've taken throughout the years and I've played it to my, to my game uh, today. Right. Now, now Chris, I, I kind of to toss, toss it back to you real quick. Um, when you first met Jamie, I, I imagine there's some connection there between your college coach. Is that, is that fair? Right. Um, so I'm just curious, Chris, on, on kind of when you, when you first met Jamie or started working with Jamie, um, Kind of how did, how did that go about? What were some of the first, like you sat down with Jamie, what, where were you guys? Where, where were you in the discussion? Where were you in uh, Jamie's career and your career? I want to hear what you say, because I, I, I have a clear recollection of how we met, but I want to hear what you say. <laughs> right, right. This is the fun part, Jamie. Um, so I, I've been friends with this college coach, uh, Chris Ambry, for a long time. And, um, you know, Jamie and Chris, are still really close. I mean, Chris is just a great coach and um, he's a great teacher in his own right. And um, God, what, what term is in the fall? Was it Fry's? Yeah, it was Fry's in San Jose. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we met on like the, we talked on the putting green. I mean, I've obviously known Jamie, known of Jamie for a long time, followed his career a bit. And we talked on the putting green, whatever, just kind of just sort of a random conversation about stuff. And then, um, and then you reached out to me, I guess it was that next year before Tori, right? You're like, I think you said, can you fix this or something like that? Yeah. You sent me a swing. Yeah. You I was, I was love, like crazy, <laughs> crazy behind me and just hitting these flip hooks. And <laughs> I was like, can you but, fix but just like cl classic Jamie, just like so just like concise. Can you fix this? Like there's no like extra, right? It's just like, and, um, and then I, I, I think I made you like a little video or something. You played kind of good at tour. You may have actually come in like 28th or something. <laughs> something. I remember, but I remember uh, seeing the video going, wow, I've a long ways to go. And just understanding where I was coming from swing wise, that was in a tough spot for kind of my natural ball fight, which I like to work left to right. And the pattern I had going was more of a, a draw bias kind of um, pattern. And it just didn't suit my natural eye. And it just wasn't a good, uh, good matchup. So, and then I think the, I think the first time we actually did stuff in person was Pebble that that following year. Does that seem like an accurate recollection? I think so. I know I went down. I went to LA um, with your boy Dave Katz. I don't remember if that was after Pebble or before Pebble, but yeah, it was in that West Coast swing for sure. So was that like 2014? Ooh, <sighs> it was. It was fall 2013 that we met at Fry's and then we started working uh, that, that 2014, I believe. Is that right? Or was it the, or 2012, 13? No, it's 2013 fall. Oh, and then, uh, yeah. 13, 14. I think that's right. Yeah. That's crazy. Six years, holy cow, time flies. Wow. Jamie, so what, than made you, uh, what made you reach out to Chris? Was it through your coach, Chris, um, from college recommending him or stuff that he's done online or? 
Yeah, I, I trust Chris Ambry, my college coach, more than anybody. Probably him and Como right now I trust more than anybody in, the, in my golf circle. And he was very adamant about, you know, talking to Chris and you know, kind of picking his brain and seeing if I could find a way to kind of get out of the rut I was in. And um, they quasi kind of grew up in the same area in Thousand Oaks and – Thousand Oaks? Or West Lake? Uh, Wooden well, 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 Hills for me, but yeah. yeah. West Lake Village – um, in California, so they, have a, they, had a, they had a good connection. We can talk more to that, but um, yeah, Denver was a guy that is a guy that I would trust with any decision that he ever made for me, so it was an easy choice. So one of the intentions I had of having you guys on here is I obviously get to see you guys work together about the probably last four winners have been at Bears Club, starting out with me like slightly stalking you guys my first year, looking and listening around. Um, from a coaching standpoint, I mean, the players are fun to be around, but it's really fun to watch how you guys interact with each other. And I think that's one thing a lot of people don't get to see unless you go to a PGA Tour event. And even then you guys are in serious mode, but I like how you guys kind of work together. Can you guys talk a little bit about your, your friendship or your relationship? Can, can, I, can I go back a little bit to what we're, we're talking about real quick? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. So, so, so I, this is just sort of my take on things. And Jamie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like I, I, Jamie's – really smart and analytical and he can kind of what's the best way to put this like he can sniff out when someone's maybe not being just like as transparent and authentic with something as possible and I think Chris Zambri is very sort of like he's always trying to blow up ideas and Chris is his own harshest critic in a lot of ways and I think Jamie probably appreciates that. And I'm my own harshest critic in a lot of ways. And I think Jamie appreciates that as well. And if you look at Jamie's swing back in college, I mean, it was so good. And the reality of it is, is like, you know, in an effort to get better and, and your body changes, things can get a little bit off. And when we first started talking, it was sort of like, okay, what you did in college was really good. Can we kind of get in that same ballpark? And, um, you know, I think we just have, we've had a lot of like just very sort of honest and transparent conversations. And I think that just builds a place where, you know, I'm never coming at him with like, I have the answers. And I've, I think, I think if I did, or someone came at Jamie with that mentality that I have the answers, he would probably be like, ah, I don't think that's true. And it'd probably, he'd probably run the other way. I don't know. Is that fair? That's very fair. Um, I've had my fair share of experiences, not just in person, but just watching um instruction online or instagram whatever and if i see someone that's just pushing a certain swing thought or this idea or just an overall theory oh, that everybody should swing this way i know because of chris you know como that that's just not the way a golfer swings. that's not the way that some of the best players of all time so long everyone has a different swing so why is someone going to push their one single theory on every single student. That's just not the right way to teach. Jamie, how, wait. how important, sorry, Chris, but how important was that uh, with Chris that right off the bat, he didn't jump into a specific swing change. It was more of a discussion, um, more, more of you understanding where he was coming from and, and him not delivering, hey, this is how it's got to be. Yeah, it was big. Um, the first time we met was at Prize, like you mentioned, and he pulled me aside off the putting green after one of the rounds, maybe round two or three. And he brought me into the scoring tent or the first tee tent, and he was discussing his – or talking about his 3D flat spot theory at the time, which was, you know, pretty far advanced at the time. And in my head, I'm like, wow, this is a lot of information. I don't really understand it very much, but it made sense on a, on a, on a big level. And – um there's definitely something to his methodology that I appreciated and that I hadn't heard before, but you know, thinking through it logically, it made sense to me. So I'm, I'm a, I like, I appreciate common sense or just things that you can just think through and go, okay, that makes sense. Or if something doesn't make sense, I'm totally off of it. But um, the way he approached things initially was, you know, a turn on. Because Chris, it seems like, um, Many of your tour players, at least, are similar to Jamie in that aspect where uh, they're pretty smart guys, pretty intelligent um, and aware of what they're trying to do rather than, hey, 
you're telling me to do this. Okay, I'm going to go do this. Uh, would you say that's fair? Um, yeah. I wouldn't say that's true across all the people I teach. I mean, I teach a lot of juniors who aren't right, right, necessarily right. like that. But I, I've also, I've worked with a lot of tour guys who have gone down paths where they've made big changes to their swings. And, you know, again, it's, it's, it's always 2020 hindsight. So it's not to say that, that, you know, what they were doing almost necessarily air quotes wrong. It just may not have fit them, but then it becomes about starting to kind of unravel that, that those changes a bit and understanding maybe what they had done previous in their career where they maybe hit a little bit better. And I think, you know, having that experience, it's, it's much better on the front end to kind of basically talk through things and really sort of discuss things and, and, and very less about, okay, this is what you got to do. Like you just mentioned, but more about a collaboration of we're going to kind of figure this out together. Mm -hmm. And that just happens to be the population of poor people that I've seen to work with more or less. Um, and Como's, he's, him and I have worked, I mean, it's been six years now, or whatever, six, seven years, and he's, he's bounced some ideas off of me about the swing or a feel that I'm hesitant at first, and I eventually kind of get a feel for it, and I love it, and then there's some stuff where I try it, and I immediately hate it, and we just toss it aside and go, you know what, not for me. Go ahead. What? No, 100%. Yeah. And it's, it's, I think a lot of it is up to the, the people to feel comfortable because obviously the ones, you know, hitting golf shots when it's most important that they know quickly, like a good player can feel out something that'll work for them or would not work for them pretty quickly. And I think that's up to the student to have the ability to say, this isn't for me. Uh, let's try something else or not. At, at the end of the day, this is Jamie's game. This is his swing. He's the captain of the ship. And it's just, I'm just, I'm just kind of trying to like help out and bounce stuff off of each other. And I might be, sometimes there's times where I'm like, man, let's really give this a go. But then there's other stuff and, and he's pretty, he'll be pretty open to that and give it a real fair shot. But then there's times where he just like vetoes it and he's like, nah, I just, this is not something I can do. And at the end of the day, he is a great athlete. He's got a great connection to his body. And, and I have a lot of sort of faith and, and faith and trust in that intuition that he has. So, if he's pulling the veto, it's like, okay, it's probably not the right direction for him to go. All right. All right. Yeah, because Jamie, I got a question for Jamie. Oh, sorry. Who did I cut off? Go ahead. Uh, Jamie, I was going to say, is there a point in time when you were working with Chris? Because I know you've worked with some previous instructors and it didn't go great. Was there a point in time where you said, you know what? This is my guy. I trust him. I got full faith in him. Looking back on it, I'm not sure. It's kind of like asking the you, when you met your wife, if you knew you were going to marry her or not. Um, I don't remember a specific time, but I remember spe seeing a really high increase in, in the ability to strike the golf ball. And for me, that's always been the struggle for me on a, rel on a relative um, basis. Um, but I started seeing some consistency, some feelings of being, wow, this actually feels relatively easy. Um, but not, there wasn't something you said. It was just an accumulation of um, the work we've been doing to see some good results. And, you know, it took a long time. I, I was, I was down a path that for my body and for my, my, my natural motion and my eyes and my eyesight that just wasn't working for me. So I did change something. Interesting. That's, I mean, I think that's, uh, you know, something that, you know, I know we've talked about it in the past, just sometimes you, you, you work on something, it could be the wrong thing, but it helps lead you to the better thing. And, uh, you know, and, and we all struggle in the game of golf. There's ebb and flows to it. And I know Chris has spoken about that before. I watched a podcast yesterday with him and uh, Trevor Immelman. I thought it was fantastic. And Trevor was excellent in how he talked about the whole ebb and flows of the games. And then what really stuck out in my mind, Chris, was that how you mentioned how you don't, don't panic when you get to that bottom part. If you start panicking and making changes, then you don't even, you don't even know what, what your fundamentals are. Yeah. Yeah. Golf's crazy. <laughs> the, the, the path to progress isn't like this linear up, upward slope. It's got, even if the whole trend is upward, there's lots of down takes, everyone, up takes. Everyone on tour knows that anybody in that locker room is not too far away from playing great or playing bad. So you can show up one week and you got it. And next week you just can't play dead in the Western. So you just never know. And a lot of these, a lot of these instructors or a lot of these, um, I guess students 
instructors looking for this little quick power tip, we call it just some kind of lightning in a bottle, just tip that's going to throw them over the edge. And that's just not the way the game works, you know? It happened no, no. at uh, Byron Nelson. Um, <laughs> that, that one day, we were like the warm up was like, it was, it was pretty, it was that first year we were working. And oh, you yeah. warmed up. You warmed up so bad. And I was like, oh my God. Like oh my god! Yeah, was the power, was the power tip. You gave me a power tip. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but I remember it was hit the. It was hit like a string back back behind the ball to try to get the club to come out a little earlier, and you like shot sixty five or something. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I love the field that weekend. Like strokes gained something. I don't remember. I remember going. What was going on? And that's just <laughs> if you're having a bad day practicing or a bad warm up, it's not indicative of what's going to happen on the course or you know the next few months. So. You just never know. It's just a crazy game. I would it's love a crazy it. Crazy game. Can you guys talk a little bit about what? Uh, like, I get to see you guys work together, which is kind of cool. But um, I don't know if people out there really understand what goes into like a typical session, a practice session, off season versus in season, or how you guys spend your time. Short game, long game. Tech, technical stuff, video, swing catalyst, track man. Like, what kind of stuff are you using when you work together, and, and what kind of area of the game are you working on? Como, what do you got? I mean, I would say as a generality, like if we're not at a tournament or sort of, you know, whatever, just like an off week or air quotes off season thing, we're probably a little bit more aggressive with swing stuff, things that we want to kind of get in there with the swing. Um, meaning it's just the focus. He'll, he'll really try to push a feel, even if it's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and, you know, we're just more heavily skewed in that direction with our, with our practice time. Um, going to a tournament, it's pretty just, you know, we, we have a couple things that we've sort of identified that we're trying to slow bleed in there over whatever duration of time. And we usually spend really every day, a little bit of time, just kind of doing whatever it is to, again, slow bleed it in there. It's not as invasive. It's not as aggressive with it. Um, you know, in general, Jamie li likes to cut it, but the tendency now is to maybe overcut it. So oftentimes at a tournament, we're doing some stuff to kind of neutralize that a bit, almost trying to get him to be able to draw it a little bit because once he starts playing, it's just going to typically go more and more in that sort of cut direction. So it's really just trying to balance that out a little bit um, with whatever against drill or feel, or, you know, sometimes I'll kind of move around and stuff. Um, and then at the tournaments, there's just this normal sort of tournament prep stuff. Um, I don't think you get, some people are super structured with their stuff. That's just not really you. I try to sometimes get you to, you know, play games, but he always, she's like, I don't want to play a game, but, um, games you know, the, he'll do playing games on the golf course with my friends and playing for money. But yeah, playing yeah. Some, like, little artificial game on the shipping greens. Just, I, <laughs> <time with> that. <laughs> I get shot down all the time, but yeah. he just goes through his normal routine. You know, he spends a fair amount of time putting and shipping. I mean, that's probably at a tournament doing most of your stuff there. He'll hit a couple balls, but he's not trying to wear himself out. He's, he's more in, okay, how do I get a feel for the course? How do I get a feel for what my swing is doing? Get prepared around the greens and then, um, you know, not wear his body out so that the week is, isn't longer than it needs to be. Yeah. Now, do you guys have a team of other coaches that you work with in different areas of the game or strength or anything? Or is Chris kind of the figurehead in, in that and then you guys go from there? Chris does a great job about delegating certain times and um, just instruction maybe once a year, or once every six months. I've seen John Graham a few times, a putting coach from Rochester. He's amazing. Um, we'll check in with him every once in a while to kind of get a feel for my stroke, make sure I'm hitting all my checkpoints. Um, I took a, we took a chipping lesson from Gabriel Hernstadt in Phoenix and I learned something from him in the hour that we, that we worked together that, has stuck with me and I've passed that advice along to, you know, other people. So, um, you know, Chris is great in the fact that he's not afraid to, if he feels like I could benefit from, you know, teacher X or whatever, then we'll see him and, you know, grab as much info from anybody as I can. There's no harm in doing that. I, I, I just, I really believe that like, I, I only want to be a part of someone's sort of golf experience career. If I really feel like, you know, one, I can help them. And in a, in a sense, I'm the, I'm, I'm the best person that can help them, which obviously everybody's got their own who would be their best coach for them type of thing. Um, 
But to me, it's like, if I feel like there's someone who can fill a need with something that he needs, right. To fill a need in his game, I'm going to, I'm going to bring him in. Um, and I think that's part of where we probably have like a good relationship and trust. Cause I think he kind of knows that, you know, that there's been a lot of talk, at least I've seen on social media of different coaches talking about, I think versus I know coming out of your mouth as a coach, you know, when, when does that line, when do you go from, I know, like with Jamie to, I think I know it, but I'm going to go reach out to another coach and, and find that answer. I think some people tend to be afraid to, to tell their clients, let's bring in another person. And like, what's that conversation look like between you guys, you know, bringing in someone to help Jamie on a different area of his game. I mean, you just, I don't know. You bring, I mean, at the end of the day, you bring them in and it's not like what they're saying is absolute truth either, right? Like they come in and then we discuss it and we kind of say like, okay, we like this, we like that. I think we should do this. So again, it's, it's never, I think the idea is it's like no one owns the truth or the information or the best way to do it, right? Everybody's got their sort of perspective based upon whatever lens they're looking at through, whatever their experiences is. is. And, and there's times when we feel like, hey, it's worth kind of hearing this person's perspective but then we're going to vet that also. Like it, it's not like that person comes in and they know either. Right. So, um, yeah, I think that's where it becomes kind of like a team of like, Hey, look, you know, we're just going to do whatever we can to try and help them get better. So Chris, quick, quick question, Chris. Um, you know, we have, we have quite a bit of coaches on, on the, uh, viewing this at the moment. I think this could be a great question for, for all of us just to learn from, from you is you seem like there's, absolutely zero ego in in how you view um coaching all your players you kind of take the ego completely out of it and what i mean specifically on that is it's it you give the option to the player um and you kind of say hey listen here's where we are these are your options um is that something that you grew into as a coach is that something that more is your personality maybe that was you as a player um, can, can you kind of elaborate on, on kind of that? I, I guess it's almost like your style, give or take, or um, because you see some of these in the older generation. I, I don't want to say the older instructors, but the older generation, it was more, hey, listen, dude, this is this is what we're gonna do. And, and I feel like just discussing with you and Jamie that this friendship is at the core of everything. And he feels, because the way I've always looked at the player-coach relationship is there, the trust, I don't even think people can fathom how much trust goes into this. Because at the end of the day, the food that's going on the table for Jamie has a lot to do with him trusting everything that you're saying and, and where you're guiding him. And I'm just curious on um, kind of, is that something that you learned? Is that something um, that you, if you could just elaborate on that? Yeah. I mean, I just think it's, it's the truth, right? So like to say like, Hey, this is the way that's just not, it's just not going to be an accurate statement. So, so to me, it's more of a function of what is the reality of the situation. And that's not even to say as a coach, you need to tell a player all that, right? Like some players, they don't want to hear kind of like all these. And even if I say, here are some potential options that I think exist, there's probably many options outside of even what I'm saying. Right. So Sure. There, there, there's so many different paths to success, paths that are even outside of what like we even know, right? So to me, it's just, it's just kind of like, hey, look, this is my thought prices right now. This is how I see potential directions to go. Let's talk through this a bit. Um, I don't think that approach necessarily works with all personalities. Some people, you just need to be like, okay, in my mind, I think there's a couple different options on it, obviously, but this is the direction we're going to go. And even with Jamie, I sometimes kind of say that, but I, I preface it with, he just knows that I'm not saying this is just the answer, but it's like, look, knowing what I know about you, I think this is the best path. And I think it's just coming at it from a certain level of, of, of honesty more than anything. I don't know if it's lack of ego or whatever. It's just, it's just kind of just being honest, I think. Right. No, I, I think it's just more the way, I mean, the way I just listening in here, um, the communication between the two of you seem, I mean, it seems terrific. I, I mean, we hear, you know, you hear Spieth during that time was, was talking about his team, right? It, it, the we's and the teams and, and the, these specific forms of vocabulary. And it seems like specifically between you and Jamie, 
um, the, the trust, the trust isn't even a question here. Um, would you say that's fair, Jamie? Yeah, very fair. He understands my body, my patterns, and I'll, there'll be stuff that in my mind I would love to be able to do with the golf swing. I just don't think I, I might not get to that point and we work around that and we find a, a, a way around it. Um, I'll never be the guy that's super open at impact with you know, really insane, whatever you call it, dynamic posture or whatever, or just not the way I hit the golf ball. And so we find ways to make that match up with, you know, whatever works best for me. And he knows that he's seen, he's, he's seen me swing for seven years now and he's seen a bunch of footage when I was younger. So, I mean, nobody knows my swing, you know, more than he does. All right. All right. I, I mean, I, I think to me, you know, like I said, you have, um, at least for me, when I look at this, I, I, I look at see what, what creates success out on tour. And I think that's the premise of this, of this webinar here is, you know, getting to know the two of you very closely, but also getting um, kind of an understanding, Chris, on what it's like to coach out on tour. Right, and, and, and walking into the lines, then, so to speak, and um, talk to these players that, that certainly are incredibly educated on, on their golf swing, especially more so now here in 2020. You see these younger kids coming up. They, you ask them what their ball is doing and why it's doing what it's doing, a lot of them can give you a pretty educated answer. So, you know, what, what I kind of what I'm seeing between the, you know, what I'm hearing that that is just uh, something that I think is very important nowadays is, you know, you, you got, you got a very healthy friendship in, in this one spot, but you got the trust value in the other spot. And I think there's no secret that you guys have been together as long as you have, because as far as a, a PGA tour coach and player, you know, you, you guys are like an old married couple by this point. <laughs> well, well, so, I, I mean, and this is kind of, what what turns into success on on tour or or like with any coaching player relationship in my opinion one i think the coach has to go into it not being sort of dogmatic and 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 willing to be kind of like a, a problem solver that will update off of new information whether it be a person's body changing or or whatever it is and i think with a player the more a coach and a player spend time together the coach is getting more information about that player. So that's, that's in a lot of ways building their sort of database about that player in the sense will should in theory, make them a more effective problem solver that, for that player. Um, you know, given that they're going into it with that sort of problem solving mentality in the first place. Um, the hard part is, is that, you know, the reality of it is as a coach and a player usually has to have, especially on tour, usually has to have some, front end success for that the relationship to build like if a, if a guy goes to coach and you know a year later he's playing worse even though the coach in a sense is actually probably a better coach for that player at that point than when they started the relationship because he's gotten more information about that player that relationship is just not going to continue on right so there is a little bit of that sort of front end you kind of need to have some success to let everything kind of build but you know my advice to players or coaches that are trying to kind of find that, that right relationship with someone is, is, you know, find someone who's going into it, the right sort of like philosophy approach in terms of, you know, again, in my opinion, not being dogmatic and then letting yourself go through those upticks and downticks in your career together. Cause that's actually making that coach a better coach for you in a way. Right. Interesting. Chris, I got a question for you. How, how did you get to where you are right now? I know, um, you know, in, in terms of golf instruction, you're one of the best out there in terms of the science and knowing all, and being the, uh, uh, at the front of all this stuff, uh, whether it's TrackMan or Swing Catalyst or all this stuff. And how did you get there? Where did, when did you start teaching and how did you get to where you are today? I mean, I've been teaching for 22 years now. Um, <clears throat> So I'm, I'm 42, I'm going to be 43 pretty soon. Um, you know, just really early on was into like learning from other teachers. Chris Zambri was a guy I learned from. And I've always sort of picked the brains of a lot of different teachers and really try to understand kind of like the logic and reasoning they were going into it with. 
Um, you know, start out in California, Chris Zambri, a guy named Roger Gunn, Ted Lehman out there. Then I started working with a guy named Adam Schreiber or picking his brain, watching him teach. Worked for Haney for a little bit, spent a couple years with Mac O'Grady, uh, going to his golf schools, um, just sort of jumped around trying to like see all, worked at Ledbetter's place in Florida, the uh, junior place for a little bit. Um, and then, uh, you know, again, just try to take in these different philosophies and just kind of really sort of tease out the logic of when they worked, why they worked. Um, Cause they all have worked at some point, right? You wouldn't have heard of these teachers Absolutely. if they hadn't had success at some point. Um, but also, you know, all of us teachers have had failures. We've all had failures. So it's also understanding why certain themes of instruction didn't work with certain faults. Um, so kind of, you know, getting both sides of that. And then just sort of through serendipity, a friend of mine was doing his, he was doing his PhD in exercise physiology. And he's like, Hey, you gotta come check out this lab. Um, hooked up with uh, a guy named Dr. Kwan at uh, TWU and uh, long story short, ended up uh, doing a bunch of biomechanics stuff with him, going to grad school um, under him. And that's where I got into like kind of the science side of stuff. And the technology, it was just basically a function of this stuff's coming out. You know, I, I feel like it's important to always stay current with what's out there, even if you're not using it. Like, I mean, I'll, I'll try to learn about the uh, various technologies that are out there even if I'm not going to use it, just to kind of know what they're measuring, um, know where there may be a potential use for it. Uh, so I don't think that's anything other than just, uh, you know, I, I feel like that's part of, of, of um, sort of our professional responsibilities to stay current with things. Absolutely. Because I always hear a lot of young people say, you know, I just want to teach. That's all I want to do. How do you start out with that? How do you go down that? Do you recommend going, working, shadowing a top instructor, uh, taking lessons from top top people? professionals how do you how do you recommend kind of going down that road if somebody at an age of 22 23 wants to get into exclusively teaching yeah I think I mean again like like good golf there's so many different paths uh, to that um, I think seeing a lot of different philosophies I, I believe that's a really good way to sort of shape your understanding of when things work why they work um, I do believe you got to just roll up your sleeves and teach I, I always tell people that probably the best experience I've had as a teacher, I moved to Dallas to uh, open up an academy here. It fell through after about a year and I got a job teaching at a driving range. And, you know, I had no reputation to precede me. I wasn't part of an academy, had no marketing. And the only way I could pay my bills was uh, getting people to hit it better and sort of having your back against the wall and having to be very pragmatic with your instruction where they aren't coming back unless they're hitting it better. Um, I felt like I actually learned quite a bit about teaching and the golf swing and, and, and how to communicate to a variety of different skill levels um, during that window. So I don't think you can circumvent actually teaching. So, you know, it can't be just an air quotes learning process. I think that helps, but then you also got to find a way to get a lot of reps in as a teacher, in my opinion. How, how um, during your journey, did you, did you go out of golf to become a better golf coach? And what I mean by that is speak to other, other uh, coaches in, in other sports or, uh, you know, in the fitness world. Have that play a part of, of your knowledge? Because it, like, it seems like a lot of your knowledge, um, certainly early on, um, had kind of was an outside-the-box thinking where now it seems – it seems quite common, <laughs> but, but you, you were kind of at the forefront of a lot of that. Um, I guess it was just the simple kind of reasoning of you're swinging a golf club at a hundred plus miles an hour and making a ball go, you know, whatever, 300 yards. So to learn a little bit about the physics that goes into that seemed important to me. And then you're using your body to do that. So to learn a little bit about the body mm -hmm. and the parent and you can only move your body in ways that your body can move like joint motions or whatever. So to me to learn about the parameters of how particular bodies can move, whether it be through tightness or whatever, that seemed to make sense. So then I sought out people who understood that side of things better. And it just, it seemed like a very kind of uh, basic piece of information to understand better the pieces of this puzzle we're sort of like working with. Right. Right. I, I, I've always, uh, you know, I remember early on kind of 
where were you? Uh, somewhere in Dallas. I forgot where you were, but um, but what I what I always remembered is is you were bringing stuff to to the golfing world, if you will, that wasn't being spoken about yet. Um, and, and I thought that was very interesting. I was curious on if you if you learned that inside of our industry or you kind of went outside of our industry. I know um, you spent some time with, with Quan down there in Texas. Um, so I, I'm just curious on kind of when you started measuring these things from, from, from different ways and how that played a part in whether it's Jamie or whether it's Trevor or any of these um, other high performing athletes. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, when I was in Texas, um, I met I met Quan at the university. They weren't doing any golf research at the time, and then I I was like, hey, do you want to study golf? So yeah, it was it was it was definitely me kind of seeking people that weren't in golf per se, mm -hmm. but feeling like they had a skill set that I think could be brought to golf. Right. Um, you know, again, biomechanics. It's really, you know, in its most fundamental component, you're just saying, you know, what are the sort of the physics of motion and then understanding the parameters of the human body to make that happen. Um, so we started collecting data on golfers that segued me into taking a bunch of classes with them and, and going to grad school with them. So um, just cause I want to understand a little bit better, but yeah, in general, to me, it's like, if, if there's someone in the world that I think can add value to golfers or the golf industry at whole as a whole, um, I'm going to, I'm going to try and reach out to them. Right. If they'll take, if they'll take my call or email. Right. right. They don't always, but. Right. Interesting. Can we, uh, can we talk about your guys' friendship outside the coaching and uh, playing aspect? Jamie, have you taught Chris how to do any woodworking yet? Some tables for the squirrels? Or... <laughs> I have not. <laughs> he's still, he, he's, he's telling me a lot about buying the correct water bottles from Whole Foods a lot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's taught me a lot about um, a lot of things. I mean, he's been a great friend for me for six, seven years. He came to our wedding in Kauai. Um, he stays with us when he's in Jupiter from time to time. We always have a good time. Um, yeah, he's a big Marvel guy. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I always try to drag him to the newest Marvel oh, movie. Oh, man, I'm never watching that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> never watching that stuff. Uh, chipping contest, who wins? Oh, uh, we wait. Hold on, let me let me talk about Jamie real quick. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, you know this, Sarah, but like, how do I say this? <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Um, Jamie is one of the, 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 the is one of the nicest guys I've ever been around. Like, it, it's very easy for a professional athlete to just be kind of like you know, professional athlete. <laughs> and Jamie, I mean, don't get me wrong. He's so competitive. He's a great competitor, but like, he's just the person that you want to help reach their goals. Like the, he, he genuinely cares about other people. He treats other people so well. And, um, you know, he's just, he's, 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 I, I always tell people he's my favorite, right? He's just a great person. Um, yeah. So it's been fun. Thank you. It's been, it's been fun, Jamie. Um, Jamie, real quick. Hey, hey. Um, yeah. just real quick, because I don't want to keep you guys on here too long. Um, but what I'm, what I'm curious on from both of you is the PGA Tour announced here that um, we're going to, we're going to have the Masters in November. Um, and, and certainly some other different set us open would be another example of this. So I'm just curious on, from a mindset standpoint, uh, a, what's Augusta going to be, be playing like in the fall? Um, and, and B, have you even given much thought to any tournaments or majors or, um, you know, based on what your tournament schedule will be like, and then B is how does this play into if you are doing any training right now, and then, Chris, I'm curious from for for Jamie and other players. Um, how do you think? How do you think Augusta is going to be playing in November? I gotta imagine it's going to be really firm, very fast. It'd be should be pretty decently warm in the in the daytime, but then cold at night. And that and that temp drops at night. Those greens, I'm sure, can get pretty firm and fast. So, might be that. Um, what was the year Zach Johnson won? 
oh seven maybe right. i think so yeah it's similar to that kind of vibe they're probably windy no, path. No. yeah i can imagine doing that but schedule wise it'll be it's gonna be just a really strange year whenever we decide to start back up and i know that we're patiently waiting um we want everything to be safe for players fans families caddies everybody involved with the tour so um you know we're just waiting waiting to get the green light and go have you been practicing jamie in my backyard i have a net and they, uh, i saw the net yeah with the i mean have you been doing a lot of practicing or just kind of hitting 20 30 balls here and there i'll maybe hit 50 balls three out of four days and get on track, man, do some path stuff, some, some numbers, some yardages. Um, but other than that, it's been really frustrating on a, you know, personally that courses, you know, five minutes north of us are open and we're closed um, in Palm Beach County. So um, definitely not um, uniformly equal throughout the country, um, unfortunately for golfers, but I'm um, doing the best we can here to just stay, stay loose and stay semi-sharp. How do you guys um, how do you guys work together long distance wise? I know Jamie, you take a million videos. I've I've seen you from different <laughs> different angles, but how do you decide um, how much time to spend together and how much video work you do to uh, sharing back and forth? Right now, it's kind of cool actually. Um, you know, without a without without seeing a ball flight, without having you know results based off the targets, it's it's kind of been good to just really work on some things I've been trying to um, put in for a while. Um, it's really easy to get um, attached to a ball flight when you're working on something and it's nice to be able to just work on a pattern or whatever you're going to work on um, without having to worry about you know what the ball is doing. So I, we both think that you know within a couple hours we'll I'll be able to hit the ball pretty straight whatever so um, yeah it's been good this is obviously un, uncharted water for everybody involved and I know that we've done some good work in Dallas Como with um, you know, just hitting balls inside into a net. And that's something that's not the most enjoyable, but there's there's a lot of great work that's out of it. All right. Well, I, I, I guess that's a, uh, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up on that one. Um, like I said, we don't want to hold you guys too late. And we really appreciate your guys' time. Um, and, and Jamie, we're certainly rooting for you like heck this, uh, this upcoming season. Um, okay, what are going to add real quick? If yeah. there are, if there are, because we, you guys talk about golf swing and teaching and, you know, working out all this stuff. And if there's are, if there are juniors watching that, it's so important to learn how to play the game. And so much of that comes from not just instruction that just comes from going on the golf course, hitting it from the trees, getting up and down from weird spots, um, you know, on tour or on any level, you're going to have days where you just, hit it terrible and you got to find a way to score. And the only way to do that is just putting yourself in position to learn how to play the game. And that, that comes from just, you know, messing around with friends, other junior friends, you have just chipping contests, hitting trick shots from trees, like that stuff that you think is kind of dumb. We do that on tour basically every round, at least one time. So, right. Um, you know, when it comes down to it, it's cool having a good, pretty looking golf swing, but you know, one thing that matters is how fast you get the ball in the hole. And that just comes from, you know, playing golf. So, so what, what advice would you have for these juniors that, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I was at an AJGA uh, this past summer up in Vermont, actually. And I kid you not, I saw probably well over 20 track mans on the driving range. And th this was a junior event. So, Clearly, um, the word "perfect" is is being chased a little, a little too often. And I'm curious to hear Chris's point on this too, after yours. But what advice would you would you give these juniors? And, and you kind of answered it to some degree. But how would you go? How did you practice as a kid, where you really learned how to post a score pretty early on? Yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing having trackman down when you're hitting balls. Um, I think maybe if that if you're doing that. 90% of the time, it's probably not the best uh, use of time. Um, but yeah, I mean, golfer to golfer, student to student, everyone has, you know, bigger holes in the game than other people. Um, but for me, I was a, in a really fortunate situation to have a good group of juniors back home in San Diego that we would just go to the golf course after school and just chip and putt for three, four hours. It's all we do is chip and putt, have short game contests, 
like we literally run around the shipping green just hitting all these all sorts of weird shots and i think that's really helped um you know turn my short game into you know my strength and that just comes from basically repetitions but just having fun while you do it chipping putting playing games um all that sorts of stuff and, and you feel like uh, 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 your games I think by, but to me, it's just it's just what I've done since I was, you know, I was just always dipping enough to course and would come out every once a year around the greens, probably three, four feet off the green and, and he had a towel and he would just be hitting full swing flop shots to a short sided pin i'm just sitting there going like, what, what what is he doing he's just getting field work <laughs> obviously he's very aggressive so he, he goes at a lot of pins so he's gonna have a lot of short sided shots but just seeing the ability to just be creative and kind of just do stuff that you know you don't see very often but i always enjoy chipping and putting as much as anything Chris, would you kind of echo Jamie's point there in, t in terms of uh, the juniors out there watching this? Uh, we certainly have a lot of juniors from the Northeast up here, so it's a little different than the talent level out in San Diego on how, at, at what point of their age, they're, they're taking it low. So I'm just curious on, on what you've seen, um, you know, because you, you teach a lot, of, a lot of these top junior golfers. So what advice would you give to those junior golfers out there? Yeah. Uh, I mean, going back to Sarah's question, I think the answer is obvious on who would win on a, a short game contest <laughs> between us. Well, it's, like asking, it's, like, it's, like ask, it's like asking us who's taller. It's like, <laughs> You've gotten really, you're a great chipper, man. You've been chipping pretty well lately. <laughs> <laughs> when, we're at a, when we're at a tour event, we joke around because like, like I'll go like do a drill with him and like kind of like move his arm or something. And we'll film it, and in the camera, I look like this, like little person, like, <laughs> like, like <laughs> just ridiculous looking. Um, but um, so, with regards to juniors, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, it, you know, again with Jamie, he's 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 just got this a great great ability to score. He's super resilient, right? Like both on the golf course and even in life. I mean, think about it. He's had some injuries. He's had a lot of sort of curveballs thrown at him in his career, and he just keeps going and just keeps bouncing back. So. He's super resilient in life, and he's resilient on the golf course. He's able to really score well, obviously, even if things aren't going great. Um, I think that's probably the most important thing for a junior to learn. I mean, I tell all my juniors, look, the best players of all time, like take Tiger, for example. Like fundamentally, Tiger is a grinder, and he's a scrambler. He just also happened to hit it really well. But the best players have that mindset of being scramblers and grinders. Um, and then if they hit it great, then they're, they're amazing, right? So for me, it's always trying to kind of teach that sort of resiliency, that tenacity that oftentimes goes with someone having a great short game. Um, because if you look at it, when people like miss greens, they don't miss it in this symmetrical way where they miss a green, hit a green, miss a green, hit a green. They'll miss like six greens in a row, right? So they have to be able to kind of like keep getting up and down when they know their swing's not right. So there's a little bit of a psychology to it, not just like the skill of having a good short game. And I'm a, I'm a big preacher of, as a junior, develop that school, that skill, that ability to kind of go on a stretch where you don't know where the ball is going, but you can kind of keep it in play and still score. And then when you do hit it well, that's when like, you know, you can really sort of maximize that, uh, that baseline sort of skill set. You told me that because you were working with a certain someone that we all would know that he would say that he would on, at any point during a round, he would just totally lose it for him. It's probably relative, but he would lose that feeling of hitting good shots or he would always hit bad shots. And he was always ready for that three, four hole stretch of where he's like, all right, I'm feeling weird. I'm gonna have to find a way to make a par or scramble, make a birdie or whatever it may be. And I know when I'm having a tough round or I'm, I'm cruising through the first 10 holes and I hit some like crazy bad shot. I'm like, all right, it's going to happen. Like I'm hitting 72 shots around. Like I'm going to hit some really bad shots and that's just the way golf is. And you're going to be okay. You're going to have the ability to find a way to 
salvage a car or maybe make a good bogey, you know? And, and, and it's probably not going to happen as like a one-off either, right? That's the thing. It's like when people start to hit it bad, they usually hit it bad for a stretch. Yeah. Because <laughs> you kind of lose a feeling or something's weird in your swing. So you got to be able to hang yeah, in there for I that start stretch. I start, I start, I start, I go, I flip hook one and I go, oh my God, what happened? I kind of I mean, I might overcorrect it or whatever. And then you're kind of trying to find that, that baseline again. And you, you'll go for two, three, four holes and just struggle with it. Yeah, I right. Think- I think that's an amazing point too, that it is for a stretch and, and to be, to be aware on how to battle it and not be surprised by it. Uh, right. Would you, would you say that's, that's fair to say, Chris, because certainly in a four round tournament, the stretch is going to come. Right. I mean, it's gonna it, come. it'd be one hell of a tournament if that stretch never appeared. Um, and I think that's very interesting for quite frankly, for any level of golfer out there, right. Where, um, if there's no surprises and, and you're you feel like you trained for that moment for that bad stretch. When and Tiger won the US Open by 15 at Pebble Beach, you went you tripled number what hole number three and bogey the next hole. Like it's just going to happen right every tournament to everybody. It's right. right back. That's, a, that's a great message for everybody listening: the recreational golfer, the country club golfer, the professional golfer, the coaches to make sure their clients understand. A lot of ours hit a bad shot and go, okay, what I do wrong? <laughs> yeah. And I think, Jamie, I, th- I think your common viewer here is so used to see- turning on the TV and seeing these guys put it to 10 feet every single hole. Yeah, you watch it. You just see a highlight package. That's all you see. Just, you see the best players hitting right. their best shots. It's not indicative of what's actually happening on tour. I, you can play around. I, I could play with a guy that finishes 10th, and I you watch through his – shot link or on on the website whatever and you see him snap hook one in the trees and then chip out into the rough and then make bogey or make a three for right. ball. it's just never it's not golden to you i mean you're gonna hit you're gonna hit well, i always i always felt it'd be almost better tv to to watch the guys fighting for the cut line oh. i yeah I, th- I think i think that'd be great tv right there you could you, you know you take some of these uh events that don't draw the largest crowd just just give me the cut line on uh, on Friday afternoon. I, I, I you know, and, and I think that's I think that's such an amazing point for for everybody. And I'm sure to some players out on tour sometimes just just to be reminded of that. And and Chris, would you say that that's something that you um, often kind of have to uh, warn your players or bring up to your players that it's okay if if you go kind of lose it for two two or three holes? Yeah, I mean, I f- if I feel like they don't have that perspective. I mean, no. I'm, I'm just a big believer is that to me, that's sort of like, you know, for a cheesy analogy, that's the equivalent of like, you know, defense wins championships type of thing. It's like, right. that's, you, you know, you, you want to build something in your game that you can rely on and having that sort of mental tenacity and that ability to get up and down over and over and over again, when things aren't going great, um, you know, that, that, that allows you to hang in there in a tournament so that you can figure it out and then kind of go on a run where you make a bunch of birdies. So I, I would say that's a big sort of foundational belief that I have with um, helping a, a player, like, develop their game. And I feel like when I watch on TV, when I watch coverage and stuff, there's such a – sometimes there's such a negative connotation about sc- the ability to scramble. Totally. Not to will say, oh, my God, he's missed, you know, five or eight of 13 greens and he's somehow – you know, whatever. It's just that's the way golf is, and some of the best players in the world have the best short games, not by accident. And you shouldn't feel ashamed to chip and putt well at all. But I feel like everyone wants to watch Rory, who's freaking incredible. He gets it so great, but there's plenty of guys who do it not so perfectly, and that's also fine. Right. And, and that's I think that's a great point because that's something psychologically that I try to like. Um, encourage a person is to have their identity more attached to their ability to scramble. Again, it goes back to the whole thing. It's like, see yourself as this incredible grinder and scrambler that just happens to hit it good. Whereas I think when people identify themselves as a ball striker, when that kind of gets a little off, now all of a sudden it's like, you know, they don't even care what score they shot if they didn't hit it great. And that's, I don't think that's a great place mentally to come from for the long run. Right. Right. No, I agree. And I, I think that's a great, uh, that's a great place to end this. Um, so the, the first thing, Chris, thank you. Um, Jamie, seriously, man, we really appreciate you coming on. 
Um, like I said, we're super excited to follow you and, and kind of feel like good things are uh, over the horizon for you. Um, and uh, so anyway, really appreciate you spending your time with us. Sarah, Colin, I don't know if you guys want to say something before, before we leave here. Thanks, Jamie, guys. Chris, appreciate the time so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jamie, real quick, um, we got to get USC's recruiting class a little bit better, man. Like, this is – I don't, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> it's cool, but we'll come back. I, I think so. All right, guys, well, listen, stay safe, be smart out there, and uh, hope to see you guys soon. Go dogs. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>